Good evening and welcome to the proceedings of the Grand Rapids Public School District. Today is Monday, December 2nd. Please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Reverend Matias, can you please take the roll? Dr. Flores. Present. Ms. Lewis. Present. Reverend Matias is present. Mr. Ross. Present. Shotkey. Here. Ms. Williams is excused. Dr. Baker. Here. Ms. Davis. Here. President Grant. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? Do I have support? Support. support. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. OK. Um, we are going to start with a our student representatives reports. Would we like to start with city or with central today? Start with city, okay. I'll go central. <laughs> um, so nice to see you all. Um, a celebration that we had at Innovation Central was that we had our family academic night um, where students and academically achieving students were acknowledged at a dinner event. Our guest speaker was Superintendent Dr. Gorman. Um, Mr. Frost wanted to appreciate Dr. Gorman for coming to speak at an event where over 400 students and family members attended. We also had our annual GRPS Senior Summit on Tuesday, November 26th, before we went on break. There were breakout sessions, opportunities to network with other seniors from other schools. Um, we, we were there for college presentations and job searching opportunities. Um, and we also got to win amazing prizes. Coming up on December 13th, we will have a day for women in STEM conference. Students will have the experience to meet and network with professional women about their field of study and careers, and I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, so during this Thanksgiving break, um, we had the turkey trot race, and there's a lot of GRPS participants, and I was happy to see that. I myself did not run, but um, City High had the highest number of registered participants. Um, City High also had um, number one for best high school band during the um, Art Van Santa Parade, and they received a $1,000 check for their accomplishments, and I'm happy about that because I'm in band. <laughs> um, City High has been working on making sure that all students feel included and welcome. So last year we had our first Black History Month assembly, and that celebrated um, Black History Month and the people that have made a way for African-American people. This year, we had our first um, Hispanic Heritage Month Assembly, and that um, celebrated Hispanic people and their past and history. And so I'm excited that we're making the moves to make sure that everyone is welcome and celebrated. We also have meals to celebrate other cultures, like our Chinese New Year meal and things like that. OK, thank you. Um, next, we have the Secretary's Report, Reverend Matias. Yeah, we do have one announcement. Uh, there's an academic committee meeting <clears throat> Uh, this Wednesday, December 4th at 4.30 p.m. at the Board Chambers Auditorium of the Grand Rapids Public School uh, Administration Building here. Uh, that's it. Thank you. And to make a note, we do, do we have public comment for agenda items? Uh, we do not. Okay. Thank you. Um, we will go into our committee chair updates, starting with Mr. Ross, we're finance committee. <laughs> yeah, finance was a week ago today. Um, the, we have a couple action items in the packet in regards to that, um, the school property tax resolution and the purchasing agenda. Um, I guess the only, I guess maybe thing to note from the finance committee meeting in particular, um, Ms. Lewis is, uh, uh, something we would like the, um, policy committee to <clears throat> consider, which is, uh, oh, is Dr. Shockey updated you already? You're nodding your head. <laughs> All right. 
Well, for the rest of everyone else, though, for sure. But just um, uh, consider um, uh, some policy consideration on uh, providing some guidance on how often we might put things out for bid, um, what category of things. Of course, most things go out for bid over, I forget the amount offhand, but, um, but it came up because there's a particular expenditure regarding um, our radio and television advertising service. And there were some questions about uh, how often we seek uh, vendors, particularly local vendors. And I think the vendor for this is a local one. But again, it was just really more along the lines of establishing some guidelines and some parameters as far as how often things like this may go out for bid and whatnot. And should that be something that we have a board policy on? So uh, aside from that, everything else was pretty standard information. Again, just the purchasing agenda and the uh, school property tax resolution which they both are in your packet. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Lewis for the Ad Hoc Policy Committee. Shall we just do the policies now that I? Um, we can uh, get to those in the action items, but okay. do you have any updates from well, your committee just, meeting? We did have our meeting and we do have some policies to, uh, to present to you tonight. Uh, we will not be meeting again until January because um, it just isn't time, but um, we are going to investigate this um, policy about bids for certain things. And we also are working uh, maybe on a bullying uh, policy that would require a report to the board, especially that we see it almost monthly perhaps. And then there was one other thing that we had talked about. Something that uh, the people who went to the last convention, something Somebody mentioned something they wanted me to do. I wrote it down. So it's not, it's forgotten, but it, it's written down. From the CUBE conference? Oh, yeah. Okay. This is from CUBE. Okay. All right. Uh, <coughs> do we have any questions for Ms. Lewis for policy committee? Okay. We will move to our Promise Zone Authority update. Mr. Hemholt. <coughs> Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Gorman. Uh, we are on the brink of the next meeting of the Promise Zone Authority. It's scheduled for tomorrow. It's a four-hour session, so there'll be a, a regular meeting uh, for the first hour starting at 2.30, and then there will be uh, about a three-hour work session. And the, the main focus on this is really to begin <coughs> to gauge where the Promise Zone Authority board members are on each of the different items that they have decisions to make about residency requirements, GPA, whether it's a two-year, two-year plus, four-year, all the different things that are, are outlined in the state law about the Promise Zone. And so we'll spend time working on that, uh, going through kind of the work session. And from that, we anticipate having uh, at least enough information to put together the, the, the draft <coughs> development plan as part of the state law. We have to put together a development plan that outlines exactly how we're going to implement. Now, the way this first plan uh, can evolve, they, if they choose to approve this development plan, uh, they can always revisit it, they can add to it. But in order for us to begin that tax capture, and this is kind of a key piece of information, is that the first two years of this Promise Zone Authority, those scholarships have to be 100% paid for by the local dollars. So we'll have to raise the money locally, but the minute the Treasury approves that uh, implementation plan, that development plan, that's the year that the tax capture starts. And then, so obviously uh, property values have been going up, Treasury projects that they're going up about 4.5%. We're being a little bit more conservative in our estimates, uh, but the, the, the goal there would be to start this as soon as we can, as soon as the board and the authority board is comfortable, uh, but there's a lot that's gonna happen tomorrow and we'll have a lot more to report back to you at the end of that meeting. Okay. Any questions? So the, just a reminder, so, so the promise zone is what? So the Promise Zone Authority is a tax, it's a, it's a tax increment financing authority where they will, uh, a portion of the state education tax, there's a 6% state education tax, uh, the 50% the of the growth in that tax capture will go to fund a portion, if not all, of the Promise Zone. So the mi bare minimum state requirement is a two-year associate degree paid for by the Promise Zone. It can go far beyond that. It can go two years to a community college, 
plus two years that follow to a four-year university uh, or a trade school. They could do four years. Obviously, the, when you start to, the more you add, the greater the price tag is going to be. So it gets rather expensive. All of those scenarios are going to be outlined. We will be sharing that with our you as the board to brief you as to all those different scenarios and what will be discussed tomorrow at the Promise Zone. Mr. Hillel, is, is this money that they can use outside of the state? Or is it at this point, that's something that the Promise Zone Authority has to determine. It must be done within the state of Michigan, but it could be done with both public and private institutions as well as skilled trades. It has to be done, in the has to be done within the state of Michigan. That means that every, every one of our students that graduates in the near future, when that is, will at least have a two-year degree paid for fully. That's correct. So wow. let's, you know, one scenario is the <clears throat> Promise Zone Authority says we want to start immediately starting with the graduates of 2020, meaning this school year, uh, all eligible students. That will be dependent if they're residents or non-residents. The board, the Promise Zone Authority Board has to determine that. Uh, but they, uh, at minimum, if they choose the bare minimum, would have their associate degree at Grand Rapids Community College paid for by the Promise Zone for all seniors graduating from all public and private high schools that are physically located within the city boundaries. So that would include Grand Rapids Christian, Catholic Central, West Catholic, North Point Christian. There's actually 27 high schools that are within the city of Grand Rapids that would be eligible for this Promise Zone scholarship. In addition to the two-year minimum, the board can choose whether they want to uh, do college career coordinators. Uh, they could look to like the two college through college initiative where we're looking to provide supports for students upon graduation and admission into uh, a two year or four year university. They'd have extra support. So there's a lot of things that the board, the Promise Zone Authority Board has to determine in order for us to complete the development plan and submit it to Treasury for approval. Not to mention you have to raise two years of funding for whatever they decide. So, so I'm going to lobby for, <laughs> the, for the people that are on this <laughs> behind this table. Just, just a couple points. Um, and I know I've said it before, and I'll keep saying it. And I, to some extent, it could be viewed as um, conflict of interest because I work at a four-year university. I would encourage that any funding, even if, we, if there's a choice to only fund at the level of two-year schools, that students that go to four-year universities can use that same level of funding to attend a four-year university. Otherwise, and being someone, I, I love GRCC, but being someone that works with helping students get to college, those considerations would take into account. And, and if we, if college is free for two years at community college, then we, we, would in, we may be encouraging students that would go to four-year schools to stay in two-year schools. And um, again, two-year schools are great. But um, some programs, they'll be at a disadvantage when they get to that program. We're basically creating a two-tier uh, college program. Um, so anyway, I think that you guys have heard me say this before, but uh, it's if you can at least maybe not pay for the full tuition of the four-year university, at least fund at the same level as a, as a two-year university, two-year college, that at least gives students a chance to make that choice. Secondly, and I'm not sure you were referring to when you said resident or non-resident, if you were referring to legal residency status. No, I'm oh, talking okay. about whether they're residents, they're, they're physically, physical home residences in the city proper okay. oh, I or see, not. I see. Okay. So for example, we have schools, students who are choosing into Grand Rapids Public Schools, Catholic okay. and Christian have kids that live in Kentwood but attend their schools. There'll be determination by the board whether or not they would provide it only to residents because the residents are the ones that are actually paying that tax. That's the tax that we capture. And everyone's paying that tax. But the portion that affects Grand Rapids the most are those that are paying it within the city. However, if you look at GRPS, you look at many other students that have opted to choose GRPS in other schools, uh, it would create kind of the winners and losers. So there's arguments that are be made on both sides. Well, I won't weigh in on that one. I'll let you guys... Figure that one out for themselves. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Next, we have the superintendent's report. Madam President, members of the board, I'd like to ask John Helmholtz to come back again, please. <laughs> Sorry, John. No, that's all right. I, I'm looking at the agenda. I was just just okay. sitting here. 
John is going to discuss the winter break schedule and notable upcoming calendar dates. All right. Thank you. Uh, so all of our buildings and offices will be closed from December 24th through January 1st. Uh, the payroll department will be open on December 27th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. for staff who may need to resolve any issues with their paychecks. Uh, loop, there is no loop programming scheduled on Friday, December 20th, and there will not be loop programming after school through that break. It'll resume on January 6th. Uh, the, um, excuse me for reading my notes here, De uh, January 2nd and January 3rd, district offices will be open from 7.30 a.m. to 4 p.m., and the district, as I said before, that will be closed between December 24th and January 1st, and there will be no access to the building with the exception of designated custodial maintenance and administrative staff. Uh, upcoming events, uh, and there's a myriad of holiday music events, so if you want some uplifting spirit and cheer, you've got to go and to any one of these musical events. Uh, they're located on our website. There are literally dozens of performances being provided at, from the elementary, K-8, middle school, and high school level. If you go to grps.org, the schedule is listed there, and certainly throughout the building here, you'll see those dates referenced. In addition to that, uh, we have our I-96 Holiday Classic Basketball Tournament East versus West on Saturday, December 14th at Ottawa Hills. Uh, we will have the Floyd Mayweather Classic Basketball Tournament. That's not until January 18th at Ottawa Hills. And a couple other mark your calendars. The Ottawa Hills Swim Invitation Invitational is February 1st at Ottawa Hills. Union High Showcase Basketball Tournament is Saturday, February 1st at City High Middle. The reason it's at City High Middle is the renovations that are taking place at Union. And if there's any additional information, then go to the website at grps.org or call uh, the athletic department. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Now, Ms. Lewis, we are ready to jump <coughs> to some action items. Yes, if we can start, well, no. Yeah, I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, yes, first we have, um, we need to ratify the resolution to ratify collective bargaining agreement for the Grand Rapids Educational Support Professionals Association. Does anyone have any comments or questions about this um, resolution? Do I have a motion to approve this resolution? So moved. Support. Reverend Matias. Dr. Flores. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. <clears throat> Matias, yes. Ms. Ross. Yes. Perdón. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Mr. Ross. Ms. Schalke. Yes. Ms. Williams is excused. Dr. Baker. Yes. Ms. Davis. Yes. President Grant. Yes. Motion carries. Next, we have the annual summer school property tax resolution. Have anyone who would like to discuss that? Do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. <coughs> Support. Reverend Matias. Dr. Flores. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Reverend Matias, yes. Mr. Ross. Yes. Ms. Shaki. Yes. Ms. Williams is excused. Dr. Baker. Yes. Ms. Will Davis. Yes. No. President Grant. Yes. Motion carries. Next, we have the purchasing agenda. Motion to approve the purchasing agenda. Support. Thank you, Reverend Matisse. Dr. Flores. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Reverend Matias, yes. Mr. Ross. Yes. Ms. Schatke. Yes. Ms. Williams is excused. Dr. Baker. Yes. Ms. Davis. Yes. President Grant. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, now for policies. Now for policies. Ms. Lewis, can we start with policy 5357? Yes, and that this, uh, concerns the uh, uh, administration of, of medicines uh, by school personnel. And basically what this one has done is added new language to allow the nurse to be more involved in the student's self-administration of, of medication, such as an EpiPen or Mm -hmm. Insulin or something like that, and so the nurse would be more involved. Yeah. 
That's actually a different number. Yeah, that's a policy 8670. That's 8670. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. We're starting with 5357. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, I can do it. Well, let's we okay. No, let's let's begin we, we, with eighty six seventy since we're there. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve um, the first reading of eighty six seventy? Motion for approval. Support. Support. Okay, Dr. Flores. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Matias. Yes. Mr. Ross. Yes. Ms. Sharkey? Yes. Ms. Williams is excused. Dr. Baker? Yes. Ms. Davis? Yes. President Grant? Yes. Motion carries. Um, now, can we move to policy 5357? 5357? That's the one we just did? No. No. Oh, I got the numbers on here. Okay. Which policy do you have? I've got uh, 5360. Okay, let's okay. go with that. Okay. Oh, uh, this policy is required by state law that we have it in our uh, policy. It uh, deals with uh, not speaking about abortions or suggesting that a girl get an abortion, and that is forbidden by state law for any <coughs> employee to discuss that with students. State Thank you. Do I have a motion? To Actually, I have, I have some uh, question regarding this. Uh, first of all, I, I read it differently than the way you refer to it. So um, suggesting a student get an abortion is different than the way this is written here. So, um, but uh, what, is, what is the board's role? And if there's a state law, what is this board's role in voting to support this? <coughs> Because I, I mean, I don't know what the condi what the situation would arise, but any school official, any board member, any employee, may at some point have a conversation with a student that could be viewed. Well, we did discuss that, and uh, this, the way we decided that this is supposed to be interpreted, my friend Ms. Pitts up there, is that this <coughs> would you would not recommend an abortion, um, you probably, the best thing would be was to suggest the girl go get some medical attention, uh, go to the doctor or something like that. But um, to suggest that a girl has an abortion or help her in any way to get an abortion is against state law and it has to be in our policy. And we have to vote in agreement with it. Yes. Or what? You know, that is the question that I asked <clears throat> Dr. Baker. <laughs> but we will get, we will, uh, if the state finds out about it, um, what is it? There'll be a lawsuit and $100,000 fine. Or Can you provide some further explanation for us, please? <laughs> Good afternoon. So as I told the committee, as your uh, counsel, I always have to advise you to comply with the law. Uh, <laughs> uh, even if we don't like the law, there are many laws, of course, on the books that we may personally dislike, but uh, as a public entity, if the law compels us to do it, um, you know, I recommend that we do it. <coughs> if we don't do it, I'm not sure what the remedy would be, um, because obviously this is a new law and it, uh, they took out a lot of the punitive. Uh, there were some aspects in the law prior to this that were punitive. There would be a personal liability and a fine and a criminalization of the employee. Uh, and as a result of a lot of backlash around that, they took those pieces out. Um, but when you don't uh, comply with the law, you subject the district to lawsuits, uh, civil liability. So. Um, so there's a law you, that says that, the board, that, that all school boards must put in shall have a policy. Must vote to put into policy. Well, they say you shall have a policy, and obviously, in order to have a policy, you have to vote to do it. Um, and Ms. Pitts, can you provide a 
some clarity for exactly what the interpretation of the policy is. Uh, Dr. Baker was saying he interpreted it to be a little bit different. Well, um, so first of all, uh, you know, other than perhaps this being offensive to some, just the stating of it being offensive to some, our staff uh, don't do this anyway. I mean, we would not, uh, we don't provide medical recommendations for medical treatment. Obviously, that's between the student and his or her parent. Um, uh, we also have social workers, et cetera, that uh, can link um, students to other outside entities that would be more appropriate for giving that kind of uh, medical advice. Um, so, um, you know, we, we recommend the staff just stay away from any of those types of discussions, you know, regardless of what they are, because it's really not our role. Our role is to comply with physician orders um, and uh, to assist parents in, in, the, in those kinds of, you know, implementing that. And some things, some, some instances helping uh, our own staff, as you'll see in the next policy, to self-administer certain medications. So we try to stay in our role because that helps us uh, avoid legal liability, which even if you win is often very expensive and it takes, you know, takes money away from our, our core business, so. Is there any other policy where a board member speaking to a student outside of their capacity as a board member would be expected to behave in a certain way? Because this sounds like well, if a board member was talking to a mm -hmm. neighbor who was a DRPS student mm -hmm. and suggested that they visit a Planned Parenthood clinic, mm -hmm. but that I, I can't think of any other situation, mm -hmm. any other policy where a board member is excluded from. Well, this has. This seems staff, like a gag rule yeah. on board mm -hmm. members mm -hmm. outside of their role as. Mm -hmm official members of the board. Well, I, see, and this is where I think the, the distinction would be um, your board members taking action when you all collectively uh, are at a meeting, you decide things individually. Uh, it depends if, you know, if this is a relative of, of yours or something like that. You have, you're an uncle, you're not acting in your capacity as a board member. Those are arguments that could legitimately be made. Other, the only other policy that I can think of that maybe comes close as the um, ethical behavior towards students um, uh, that just puts some parameters on how we're to interact with students um, from an ethical standpoint and a, a, you know, an appearance st standard, um, but nothing as specific that I can think of other than in that, in that context. So, Dr. Baker, I guess I'm curious as I'm reading this. It um, uh, sounds like you, and I apologize if I'm putting words in your mouth, but maybe instead of shall not refer a student, is that uh, phrase refer a student, is that something that seems um, a little more action oriented as opposed to suggest, recommend, um, refer almost makes it sound like you are sending them to a particular place. I guess I'm just trying to unpack, you know, maybe what verbiage in here gives you pause. Mm -hmm. Ms. Pitts, and I, uh, I don't know if they have it, but we received exactly what the law says. Yeah, I was going to, yeah, I was going to respond yeah. to that. Yeah. Uh, that the law gives you specific language uh, to use, and so we just use that language. We didn't uh, deviate from that. Just as, um, would you like to read that? Uh? I can. Mm -hmm. A school official, board member, or employee of the district shall not refer a student for an abortion or assist a student in obtaining abortion. This prohibition does not apply to a person who is the parent or legal guardian of that student. If a parent or legal guardian of a student enrolled in the district believes that this policy has been violated, he or she may file a complaint with the superintendent. All complaints will be investigated. A written report of the findings will be provided to the complainant and the superintendent of public instruction within 30 days of the complaint in accordance with state law. Any employee who violates this policy will su be subject to discipline up to and including termination. I don't know what they're going to do with us necessarily as board members, but obviously they have plans for employees. So which part of that was the, um, the state mandated language? That's the first paragraph? The whole, that, no, the whole thing. thing. So the... State has 
dictated that we say that we talk about um, all complaints will be investigated and a written report of the findings be provided. That is, okay. um, yes. can you, can you, will you send that to sure, all of us, please? Sure, mm -hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. You mean the copy of what? What we're going to oh, it's, it's, state law. I yeah, that's just one of the state laws. Mm -hmm. What Absolutely. I was curious about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't read this as a board member <laughs> acting as a board. Obviously, we as a board would mm -hmm. never vote on advice mm -hmm. to a student. Mm -hmm. But it basically, to me, I read it as if I'm a board member and mm -hmm. any student, even mm -hmm. if they're over the age of 18, mm -hmm. that I suggest mm -hmm. visit a Planned Parenthood, mm -hmm. um, unless it's my child. Mm -hmm. Um, then I would be in violation of this law. Yes. In, in any conversation mm -hmm. that could hypothetically mm -hmm. exist for any of us board members. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that doesn't preclude you from talking to a student's parent, obviously. It says only to the student. I, or I to agree. another adult I can't who's imagine, close to I, that student. I can't mm -hmm. imagine another mm -hmm. policy that basically mm -hmm. is a gag rule for board yeah. members. I mean, in... Like I said, if it ever uh, came up, obviously it could be challenged. Just depends on you know how much money you want to spend doing it. But because I think the most important word in here, not so much board members, but when we were discussing this at the um, policy committee, it's really a teacher, you know, who's close to a kid, and um, you know, and we agreed <laughs> on the committee that we would, <clears throat> but we couldn't say Planned Parenthood because that's viewed as just to get medical help is all you could suggest. Mm -hmm. I think the key is the word abortion. Well, if, yeah, if a parent sees a sister student obtaining an abortion mm -hmm. by sending them to a health clinic that mm -hmm. provides abortions, well, by I suggesting think, a health clinic. Yeah. clinic solely that. provides abortions, I could. Well, Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. doesn't. It, that's, a, that's a matter of perception. Yeah, but pa Planned Parenthood, I think, factually, not a matter of perception, mm -hmm. does other things other than abortions. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's a matter does, of fact. Actually, it does, but the right. accusations, mm -hmm. but the accusations are that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. so. Well, those are uninformed. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I do feel like we're so. at a good position to take a vote since this is um, language that is, we don't have much leeway. Well, I am going to go ahead and read it since we're on it, though. It says, okay. um, the governing board of a district or any media school district shall adopt and implement mm -hmm. a disciplinary policy for a school official, mm -hmm. member of a governing board, or employee of the district or intermediate district mm -hmm. who refers a pupil for, ab for an abortion or assists a pupil in obtaining an abortion who is not the parent or legal guardian of that pupil. So... Mm -hmm. Just if any case anyone was curious. Other than I think curious. that intermediate district language is not in. No, it's not. No, that doesn't that's not. But that's, I was that's just the reading most, the, the, right. the state right. code. That's all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that, is that is sufficient? Is, okay. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really torn by that because it's, it's not a vote. You know, it's like shall administer, shall create this policy, then the policy is created. Um, you object to the policy or the fact that, and this is what I objected to, was that the state is telling us. It doesn't make sense for me to vote on it because I, I don't want to vote for this language. But um, the state has said we have to administer a policy. So. They convinced me that I didn't have any choice, so. <laughs> well, everyone still has their vote. So um, do I have a motion to approve the first reading of policy 5360? So moved. I have support. support. Reverend Matias? Dr. Flores? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Reverend Matias, yes. Mr. Ross? Yes. Ms. Sharkey? Yes. Ms. Williams is excused. Dr. Baker? <clears throat> no. Ms. Davis? Yes. President Grant? Yes. Motion carries. All right. Do we have, do I have the right one? Um, 5695, ethical that, responsibility. That will be the right one right now. So we are going to look at 5695. Is that it? Yes. Okay. Um, this one uh, simply just adds 
specific language uh, to the Family Medical Leave Act uh, that um, these requirements are outlined in the law so that we can just put them on our policy. And I do want to go back because the things that are presented here on my computer aren't exactly, I guess, that are on the agenda, but uh, I want to do go back to this administration of medicine because we were working on the rules as well, and there are lots of rules that go around that administration of medicine. I'm sorry, well, I want to make sure that I understand. Have we gone through 5695? 5695 is ethical responsibilities, and that is the one that I just said, 5695. It just, it, oh, this is the code of ethics for the entire um, district, and we, uh, the, the um, Policy Committee evaluated three different ones. I don't know. I think I'm mixed up here. I'm getting these questions looked. Okay. No, you were, you were on the correct track, I believe. Can um, Ms. Davis, are you on the Policy Committee? Yes, I'm looking at 5695. So you all reviewed three, you were saying? Three yes, codes of responsibilities. Ethics. Three codes yes. of ethics. Okay. Three different ones, one from the Michigan Association of School Boards, one from a general uh, public service code of ethics, and then one that came from the Michigan Department of Education. Mm -hmm. And we, d we selected the one from the Michigan Department of Education. Okay. okay. Yes, Blitz, do you want to give some yes feedback? just to Thank you. support. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, the board, uh, the committee has been looking at uh, considering ethical, um, some additional strengthening, some uh, ethical requirements for uh, the staff and the board. The initial uh, proposal that we were looking at uh, came out in 2012, and it was a, a combination of the Michigan School Boards Association, Michigan Department of Education, and lots of other organizations. Um, subsequently, and, and perhaps fortunately, we, um, the decision uh, was delayed because the Michigan Department of Education just recently came out with new guidelines for ethical um, behavior, not just for teachers, but for staff. So if what, uh, we have the guidelines attached and you'll see that there are many things that yes, apply to the schoolhouse, apply to uh, teachers, but there are things that apply to all of us uh, in terms of being honest about things, not um, you know, stealing, those, those kinds of things. So uh, this latest version, or the one that we, uh, that the committee decided that they were going to accept is the uh, most recent, June of 2019, I believe, um, uh, guidelines submitted by the, uh, or proposed uh, by the uh, Michigan Department of Education. Okay. Are there other questions about that? Do I have a motion to approve the first reading of policy 5695? So moved. Support. Matias. Okay. Dr. Flores. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Reverend Matias, yes. Mr. Ross. Yes. Ms. Sharkey. Yes. Ms. Williams is excused. Dr. Baker. Yes. Ms. Davis. Yes. President Grant. Yes. Motion carries. And um, we will finish up with policy 5357. <coughs> 5357. And this is uh, the addition of the language that's required by law <coughs> for the family uh, leave. And it's language we've added because the law requires us to add it. Just like it's defining who can get the six weeks of, or the six months of unpaid leave, under what circumstances do we allow that to happen? Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the first reading of 5357? Motion for approval. Support. Thank you. Reverend Matisse? Dr. Flores? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Reverend Matias, yes. Mr. Ross? Yes. Ms. Schottke? Yes. Ms. Williams is excused. Dr. Baker? Yes. Ms. Davis? Yes. President Grant? Yes. Motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda grouping? Motion for approval. Support? Uh, 
Dr. Flores. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Matias, yes. Mr. Ross. Yes. Ms. Shaki. Yes. Ms. Williams is excused. Dr. Baker. Yes. Ms. Davis. Yes. President Grant. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. We do not have any discussion items for this evening, but we do have public comment. Yes, we do. Okay. Can I ask Mr. Fink to come forward? <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay, thank you. If you can just state your name and you'll have three minutes to make your comments. Thank My you. name is Rich Fink. Um, I'm here representing GREJ. I'm a retired teacher. Um, here tonight with some further evidence of what we have talked about in terms of a two-tiered education system in GRPS. Um, I've given you the data that I'm using, which comes from the My School Data Parent Dashboard for School Transparencies. Um, obviously, with just three minutes, I'm not able to go through all of that data, but I would like to share some highlights from those findings. And as I'm talking about this, um, Consider the fact that the state average of proficiency for students is 42%. In the K through five schools, I found two schools that actually scored above the state average. CA Frost and Stocking, which serves 701 students out of the 4,363 students <coughs> currently enrolled in K-5 schools. <clears throat> Overall, in this grouping of schools, about 84% of the students failed to meet that state average. In the K-8 schools, one school scored at that state average, North Park Montessori Academy, which serves just 428 of the 2,696 students enrolled. Again, 84% of the students enrolled failed to meet the state average. In the 6-8 schools, Blanford Nature Center, Center for Economicology, I think that's how you say it, and John Ball Park Zoo, serving just 180 students of the 1,934 students currently enrolled in six through eight programs. So overall, 91% of the students enrolled failed to meet that state standard. And in our K-12 schools, one school scored at or above the state average which was Lincoln School, serving 147 of the 1,104 students enrolled. 87% of the students enrolled failed to meet the state average. This kind of leaves me with several questions. The first one being, I'm wondering if possibly in the district, and I think this is happening across the state, the standards that are being demanded of the state are developmentally appropriate or not with so many students coming to school not prepared for kindergarten, <clears throat> not prepared to use scissors, pencils, crayons, et cetera, if maybe that is part of the issue that we're seeing in terms of this number of students that are failing to meet the state average. Another question that I would have is, are all these schools using the same materials? Do they have the same textbooks, the same curricular programs? And second one would be class size. Is this a determiner? Are class sizes typically the same across the district? I know in the data that I gave you. Your time is up. Time is up? OK. Thank you. You got it. Matthew. OK. Do we have any more? We do not. Do we have any more cards? OK. Um, Superintendent's comments? No comment. Dr. Flores? No comment. Dr. Baker? No comment. Ms. Davis? No comment. Mr. Ross? Uh, no comment. Ms. Shockey? No comment. Reverend Matisse? Uh, I ran the turkey trout <laughs> uh, with my wife. And uh, I have to say that um, it's quite unique for the public schools to bring the community together in that way. It was quite exciting. Um, 
Lots of turkeys ran. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, but, but it was quite interesting to see that it, it felt as though it was a community event as well as it was uh, the public schools doing something to, um, to bring attention to its athletics. So that, it, was, it was quite exciting. Um, lots of people um, running together, families running together, uh, schools uh, volunteering, saw a lot of our own students volunteering, uh, got up quite early to uh, make it happen. So that, that, was, that was great. It was, just, it was just a lot of fun. So kudos to all the staff uh, that, that made that happen. It was quite exciting. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Lewis. I did not run the turkey trial <laughs> under any circumstances. I just wanted to add that I was uh, at the senior seminar. Thank you. And it was such a neat thing. All the seniors were there. Uh, they had these breakout sessions. They even had a fashion show showing them uh, what their graduation garbs are going to look like, sort of warned or uh, celebrated the fact that they're really halfway through their senior year, halfway to graduation. And it really was, it was great. The kids all had a good time, I think. It was, you know, and I, I hear over here that um, uh, Center for Innovation was the loudest when it was time to cheer. So um, I'm proud of all the kids. It was a great experience. And we've been doing this for a long time, and I didn't know about that. So I stopped by, and I was very glad that I did. It's a wonderful event. Thank you. Um, yes, I want to say that Turkey Trot was amazing. Kudos to uh, Mr. Johnson and your team. Um, you pull off uh, something that is amazing every year, not just in raising funds, which is important for the students, but just for really bringing the community and the city around our district. Um, Dr. Baker beat me by just a few minutes, just, <laughs> just a few minutes. So um, that, that was really wonderful. Um, that is all I have. Thank you all for coming out. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>